Good afternoon. Um, wow, I, I personally think that the topic that we've been given or that we are exploring this weekend is really timely. Because the world at the moment is reeling, you know, we are, we are post-pandemic, post-Christian, post-modern, post-everything. Uh, there are wars going on and there's famines and natural disasters, cost of living crisis, social upheavals. I mean, we can't even finish the list. So for us to go back and say, where does Christian theology base its belief about God's character? Okay, thank you. Base its belief about God's character, standing firm to it even in the face of what seems so contrary. I think it's really important. Now, one of our friends, it's important that I say this, one of our friends used to say that because of the mystery and the paradox that God is, and we've been talking about this since yesterday, you can't be a lawyer for God. And I personally agree. The ambiguity that some parts of the Bible can make matters worse and also our own experiences with God can cause problems. So there's always a posture of humility as we all theologize and, and, and pull out what we can from the Bible about this mystery called God. Thankfully, however, taking the totality of God's revelation over the centuries, we can make a case about the character of God. I would like to see what's on the screen. Is it possible? I, um, okay. Thank you very much. So the, the topic of my, thank you, the topic of the presentation is the essence of being, which is essentially what is the intrinsic and fundamental nature of existence. Now I'm going to use both the Old and New Testaments to make three propositions while exploring this concept. First of all, it has been argued that the essence of being is communion, which we see both within the Trinitarian relationship and in human beings. What communion is or does is bring the presence of another. And on our part, it allows a person to share or participate in God's life and other people's lives. And just to state the obvious, we are not talking about the Lord's Supper by communion here. And the second point is participating in God's life should ideally shape human beings to adopt and live out God's values and principles that he imparts through the Holy Spirit. John 15 verse 4 summarizes the connection between these first two propositions very well by showing that fruit can only come from abiding in the vine. And the third point, the ultimate result of this participation in God's life is participation in God's mission, which I suggest is the mission of life, which the Spirit gives holistically, cosmically, and compre comprehensively in every aspect of human existence and the whole family of creation. Participation in the life of God births participation in God's anger and resistance against death in its multifaceted, literal, and metaphorical forms. Now let's take a closer look at these um, points, proposals. Number one, okay. Um, okay, point number one. In simplistic terms, the assertion that the essence of being is communion comes from the reality that can, I, there can only be pilira because there is another person who is not pilira. So the implication is that we cannot exist without relationship. Right from Genesis 1, the Bible shows the God creating and saying, let us, and scholars agree that the plural form of the verb is used. And then when God is creating, he makes a female and a male human being, both of whom share the image of God. 
Now, Imanko Dei remains a highly discussed concept in theology with many, many theories. What does it mean and what aspects of it were affected by the fall of human beings and the entrance of sin? I personally concur with the view that among the aspects of God's image that humanity shares is the essence of this being, in other words, communion. Now, many scholars have written about this, and one of the notable ones is John. John Zizoulas, maybe I haven't pronounced that properly, but he suggests that there's no true being without communion, and communion is the essence of Imago Dei. Other disciplines as well, such as social sciences and psychology, they support the principle of relationality. Psychologist Emma Sepala, for example, argues that while people may differ in personality and temperament, introverts and extroverts, they remain essentially communal by nature and they thrive in, within positive relationships. That is why even in pluralist society, where the world is characterized by polarity, human beings still gravitate towards relationships. And that's the reason why isolation, rejection, marginalization, and loneliness are deadly destructive and horribly painful. That also explains why God gathers humanity into communities of faith, however tiny like small groups or large ones. In our post-pandemic context, the implications of this is a conversation that is currently happening. But what has God's character to do with it? Communion suggests the presence of another. And I submit that presence implies such crucial realities like care, desire, commitment, and belonging. God's invitation for us to participate in his life, which I am using for this presentation synonymously with his presence in us through the Holy Spirit, clearly demonstrates to me his interest, love, and care for us. Jesus' promise again of a paraclete who would be in and with us forever communicates powerfully about God's commitment to us. Presence is powerful. And in my opinion, God's presence is one of these most precious gifts. Now, this concept of God seeking communion with human beings it's a theme that is perpetuated as well in the biblical narrative. All the way from Genesis to Revelation, you see God wanting to be among us. And the drama of salvation is going to conclude with the restoration of God's original intention, which foiled with the entrance of sin. In fact, the restoration will be so full that God is going to live with us in earth made new, on the earth made new. And if that doesn't scream love, I don't know what does. So the essence of being is communion, which implies presence. And as we see God's relentless desire for us to participate in his life and him in our life, we can deduce that God is interested in us and loves us. The wholesome and sensuous experience of God's presence and love makes one alive and makes this mortal life worth loving, not something to be despised. Life can only come in the context of love. And so fellowship with God enables God's image, his communal essay to be experienced. That's the first proposition. Now the second one. Um, that participating in God's life starts us on the journey of learning to embody the values, traits, and principles that undergird God's kingdom. But what is God like? As Christians, we lean on the Bible and we see it principally central to Christian thought and theology as God's revelation of himself to humanity, all together telling one unified story. And of course, the ultimate revelation of God is Jesus, and we'll get to that in the last section. To try and answer the question, what is God like? 
let's explore what God says about himself. And not surprisingly, this scripture came in Patrick's presentation this morning and in Ivana's sermon as well. And I also went to it when I was, the moment I heard character of God, it was my go-to text. And we are going to have a, a little look at that. Now, the covenant name of God to the Israelites, which connotes them as their deliverer from bondage, was Yahweh. In Exodus 34, verse 6 to 7, we hear God explaining this divine name in terms of the most unfathomable love in what has become the locus classicus of all Old Testament texts on God's character. And later on, these words are actually referenced and requoted many times in the Bible. As usual, we need to see the context to understand what's going on. This, this is always important. So God has liberated Israel from slavery in Egypt. The Exodus is such a meaningful event that the body of theology that deals with liberation use it. And Christ's ministry as well as the basis of the assertion that Christian theology is essentially a theology of liberation. We also heard from Ake's presentation this morning referring to the Exodus and how much it speaks into the whole, um, the New Testament, many aspects of the New Testament. So they've been liberated from, from bondage, and then God leads them to Mount Sinai, invites the whole nation into a covenant, and the idea is that they should be shaped by his values and character, and then represent him to all the other nations. Now Moses is up the mountain with God, sorting this covenant out, and at the base of the mountain, the Israelites are there breaking the first two covenant vows already. Now, understandably, God is hurt. It's betrayal. And he warns Moses that this betrayal is going to keep on happening. God can, has got a choice to end the partnership now. Let's just finish with this. Or show them mercy and be faithful to his promise to Abraham and his plan to redeem the whole world through them. So Moses and God go through a beautiful exchange in Exodus 33, verse 12 to 34, verse 10. It's really beautiful. Through their conversation, the narrator is showing the reader and giving insight to God's character in the context of the covenant. So essentially, Moses is saying, you can't ask us to go and not assure us that your presence is going to be here with us. And as they keep conversing back and forth, after the conversation, God actually changes his mind and decides that he's going to remain in the midst of the Israelites. And then Moses said, show me your glory. And God responds by saying, I will let my goodness pass before you. And then we fast forward to this chapter, this particular verse where God is now proclaiming his name, while he's hiding Moses in the cleft of a rock. Now, John Peckham comments on how God is at once the glory that endangers Moses' life and the mediator who makes communion possible by his own provision, illustrating the paradox of intimate relationship between the altogether holy God and sinful human beings, which can only be made, I mean, can only, is only possible by the free accommodation of God. So, how does the tension of God being merciful with the Israelites and being just play out? The statement opens with uh, God is a compassionate and gracious God. And in Hebrew, this line has got three words which rhyme. And then the next line, abundant of loyal love and faithfulness, matches the first one because it also has three Hebrew words. Now, which of those lines have got two attributes of God and they surround a fifth attribute? God is slow to anger. That's the first half of this description. And then the second half comes. God keeps loyal love for thousands. 
And by forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin, he's going to remain loyal to people who keep rebelling against him. Now, these three words referring to sin function to describe the whole scope of sin and highlight that there is no sin at all that is outside the capacity of God's forgiveness and no sin that God cannot bear for them. God's forgiveness is larger than human rebellion. But God's forgiveness doesn't mean that anybody can just do whatever they want, of course. So his mercy is balanced by what follows in the text. Yet he will surely not clear the guilty. He will visit the iniquity of the father upon sons and upon the sons of sons to the third and fourth generations of people who repeat their ancestors' refusal to enter into covenant with God. God will essentially give them up to their choice. The guilt of one in one household, as you would agree with me, naturally affects others within that household. And significantly, when three or four generations would often be contemporaries, that matters. But notice that the number of generations contrast with the massive number. God keeps loyal love to thousands. There's no mention there about a specific number of people. It's thousands. And his forgiveness of iniquity is contrasted with his justice on iniquity in the other line. And this willingness to overcome sin and the disruption of the relationship manifests the steadfastness of God's commitment, which is the only way in which divine human relationship can be continued. Now these lines are surrounding a central line about God's justice. He will not clear the guilty. So while God is slow to anger, he is also just. And this is the tension that the two verses are exploring. How does a faithful and loyal God deal with such rebellion? This is a challenge that God faces in this story, and it's the same challenge that he faces in the whole biblical narrative. And of course, the whole story of planet Earth as he works to invite people into life through relationship with him. Now, this interaction between God and Moses and the attributes he mentions lead us deeper into deciphering the character of God and the story of the Bible. For example, we discuss cover there that God feels and changes his mind and so on and so forth. And I suggest therefore that these traits is what the Holy Spirit seeks to develop in humanity. And I believe this drawing towards the character of God is demonstrated even in an individualistic society where the work of the Spirit that breaks barriers can still be seen through humanitarian endeavors from non-religious people worldwide who react or respond to the Spirit's call to act humanely. And now the last uh, proposition. Let's explore how participation in God's life and values translates to participation in God's mission. Firstly, by looking at Jesus and then the implications for us. Now, we go to Christ as our go-to because he's God's ultimate revelation and he offered clarity on some misunderstood aspects of God's character. So, we begin by seeing that in Christ there's the word of God who became flesh and the incarnation actually endorsed the value of the material, of physicality, because in Christ human body, the life-giving spirit of God lived and was at work. Jesus fulfilled the Jewish expectation, which was that the messianic son of God would be a human being who is filled with the spirit of God. We also hear Jesus declare why he came to give abundant life. And he also says in John 6 verse 63, the spirit gives life. And the words I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. And then we hear Christ declare his mission so that in his spirit-filled life, we see the, the wrath of God and the anger of God against evil and sin manifested. As Jesus resisted death in this many, many ways that he did, uh, um, 
I will not go through the, the whole section of what, you know, what Jesus encapsulated, but he was liberating people, preaching the gospel, standing in solidarity with, with people who are marginalized, the poor, empowering humanity, accepting outcasts, and following this victorious um, resurrection of Christ, the Spirit births a new community of faith to join God in the mission of life. Now, what are the implications for this participation in God's life, values, and mission for us individually and collectively as a church? First, daring to open ourselves wholeheartedly with no reservation to the Spirit of God, because the Spirit of God is the design of God to saturate us with his presence and keep us connected to Jesus. It calls for us to intentionally resist the cultural, historical, religious, and theological baggage that hinders us from living life in the Spirit the way that God wants us to. And with that comes the willingness to be transformed formed in our mind, which requires the humility of realizing that there, there's a lot to learn, but a lot, lot more to unlearn. Challenging established mindsets. And I would like to share this excerpt by Zaida Perez about reflections on the Holy Spirit. Perez uses the feminine pronoun she in referring to the Holy Spirit because the Hebrew tradition Ruach Elohim is feminine. And this is what she says. <clears throat> I love the Holy Spirit. She is like the wild child of the Trinity. Anywhere and everywhere, moving, calling forth, and stirring things up. She is wonderfully elusive, yet also fully present. She is untenable, full of possibilities and creative potential. She is and will be unconventional and even uncultured. She's the wonder that moves our questions from what does this all mean to what shall we do? She can forever alter our lives and change our world. She is life giving breath, wind, and fire. She is the Ruach Elohim, the divine uh, Numa that is always going native because she wants to be encountered by all. She is calming spirit amid the storm. She is wisdom. And in the further spirit of what shall we do, let's go to our next, um, the next implication. And I want to start this by a quote from James Cohn. And this is what he says, Christian theology is a theology of liberation. The God of the biblical tradition is not uninvolved or neutral regarding human affairs. God is decisively involved. Christian theology cannot afford to be an abstract, dispassionate discourse on the nature of God in relation to mankind. Such an analysis has no ethical implications for the contemporary forms of oppression in our society. Love is passion, and only passion is the mark of existence. So the next consideration involves daring to see that God's mission of what we call spiritual liberation from sin and the dominions of the devil is not estranged from God's mission of setting people free from lies, deception, set, and systemic mindsets and structures that keep human beings captive and devalue the dignity of both human and non-human life. That includes leaving out the conviction that getting involved in struggles of social justice is part of the gospel. The idea that we need to set these stirrings that are pertinent in our generation in order to get on with evangelism and, and the gospel and saving souls reflects the Greek dualism and platonic soul theology that still clouds our mindsets. We have a duty to argue for and live out our belief in God's interest and care for creation and the whole person. God's mission 
is a mission of total life. And wherever life is present, death is present rather, it is our mandate as participants in God's life and mission to proactively resist it. And we have to accept the fact that this living dead, we have living dead among us, even inside the church, because we are refusing to engage in these issues because we feel they are not part of the gospel. The last um, implication is um, that we exist in the, and this is more to do, even though it's similar to the second one, it's more to do with our role as a prophetic movement. We believe ourselves to be a prophetic movement. And the fact that we exist in the context of the great controversy, and we know the world has no chance of being perfect until Jesus comes, that doesn't mean we fold our hands and resign until Christ comes again. The apocalyptic mindset and orientation we have should not paralyze us. Just like the Old Testament, by Old Testament prophets who were essentially calling people back to covenant through social justice, let's live out our claim to be a prophetic movement by bringing life everywhere life is failing to flourish because we know that God will not stop working to liberate and to heal and to renew until Jesus comes again. As long as sin exists, we get involved. There's a quote there by Janice um, D. White, which some of you may know. She's a newborn alumni lecturing at Loma Linda at the moment. And she comments on this by saying that uh, God's prophetic word calls for the infusion and integration of justice in all facets of individual and communal life. There is a more that we can say about it, but we can change the world. Allow the spirit to let us change the world one life at a time, like Adra says. Conclusion. So what is the essence of being? It is communion with God and participating in the life of God. Relationship-centered spirituality is where it starts. It's the base. And this leads to an, a holistic embodiment of the values of God's kingdom, which is manifested as we accept and engage in the core of God's spirit to participate in God's mission. This renewal work by God is holistic and encompasses all areas of life, not just the spiritual. The enjoyment of God's presence and companionship has always been intricately linked with participating in what God is doing. God sensitizes the heart. And the response of a life that has been sensitized by the Spirit of God is to adopt a new life of sensitivity to all life, human and non-human, and a search for harmonious symbiotic relationality in and for all. Thank you very much.